think of ourselves as the most powerful beings in the universe, it's unsettling to discover that we're wrong. Time has come to see the world as it is. Can we pull back the veil of static and reach into the source of all being? Behind this hurt, this random pattern generated, you will be responsible for an escalation that will destroy everything. In this episode, I'm going to be getting into some things which I'm sure will be a bit too far out there for many people, even for this podcast. I deliberated on whether or not I should get into some of this stuff as it could make people write me off as a complete liar, but I decided that it was worth the risk. Alright, so I'm going to get into it. An introduction to a basic rundown of the types of spirits I've interacted with. I'm going to try to keep all the many details for later but it's almost impossible to distinguish between the three main categories of spirits I know adequately without writing a goddamn book, so I apologize for the relative brevity in dealing with such a massive subject. Actually, now as I read this, I know of many more than just three categories. Alright. The spirit world actually seems to be an even more complex, multifaceted reality than the world we are familiar with, which is already extremely complex, so it is difficult to formulate definitive categories and descriptions. A lot of what I say may seem diaphanous and convoluted, as I hardly understand these beings and realms which I am writing about myself, and they are extremely complicated and outside of our normal experience, yet also extremely familiar in some surprising ways. To refer to all these different beings as spirits is sort of like calling all ocean life on the planet Earth sea urchins, all plant life magnolias, every being in the northern hemisphere or West Highland White Terrier, or all vertebrates Greek sponge divers. They are species, kingdoms, races, nations, peoples, planets, and realities. After what I've come to know of them, it seems stupid, but I'll continue to refer to them as spirits, for simplicity. They are the real world, in a way. And we are part of that world, too, we've just forgotten. We are shared hallucination of them. A consensus reality holographic video game movie performance art made of matter, energy, and consciousness. At the same time, everything we know in our reality exists in theirs as well, to greater extents, in different perspectives, and in multiple variations. Now, on to the news. In the early 1950s, in Pelotas, in the state of Rio Grande do Sul, southern Brazil, Luis do Rosario Real and his wife Lucy Gerlach Real took a walk one night in the wood beside the sea. Suddenly, two fast-moving shadows crossed their path, which was lit by the full moon. Looking up, they saw two gigantic birds, as they thought, flying at treetop level. When the birds descended vertically and landed near the witnesses, they saw that the figures looked human and were about six feet tall. The birdmen then crouched down to the ground. The witnesses felt they were being observed, and Louise, being curious, wished to get nearer, but his wife prevailed upon him to leave, and they did so. These birdmen were presumably winged, in contrast to the earlier reports where the flying entities either had no wings or strapped on wings. That these creatures are not real birds is shown by the fact that the witnesses in this and the previous case originally thought that they were looking at huge birds until they got closer. In the next case, too, a giant bird could not have been responsible for the creature disappeared. A private on guard duty one night at Camp Okubo near Kyoto, Japan, in 1952, saw a giant bird coming down towards him. On the point of firing at it as it hovered, he felt its eyes on him, and looking more closely, he could see it was not a bird. It had a man's body, and was well over seven feet from head to toe, with a similar wingspan. The young man began firing, but when he looked to see if he had killed it, there was nothing there. The sergeant told him that another guard had seen something similar a year before. A strange sighting, again, of a winged man, but this time with a bat's wings, was made in Houston, Texas, on the 18th of June, 1953. It was 2.30 a.m. on a hot night, and three people sat talking on a front porch. Suddenly, about 25 feet away, Hilda Walker saw a huge shadow across the lawn. I thought at first it was the magnified reflection of a big moth caught in a nearby streetlight. Then the shadow seemed to bounce upward into a pecan tree. She told her companions, and they all saw the figure of a man with wings like a bat. He was dressed in gray or black, tight-fitting clothes. He stood there for about 30 seconds, swaying on the branch of the old pecan tree. Suddenly the light began to fade out slowly. They had time to see the man in detail and described him as about six and a half feet tall, wearing a black cape, skin-tight pants, and quarter-length boots. Quote, he was dressed in a uniform like a paratrooper wears. He was encased in a halo of light, said one of the witnesses. Mrs. Walker added, I could see him plain and could see he had big wings folded at his shoulders. There was a dim light all around him. 
Following that rash of winged beings, we now have an entirely different kind of entity. The witness was Iberto Villafanier, who was sleeping in an improvised bed of sheepskins at his cousin's mica mine at Sierra del Valle, Argentina, one night in 1953. He woke up suddenly and saw a beautiful woman approaching him. He thought at first he must be dreaming, but what followed convinced him he was fully awake. He got up and saw that the woman was signaling at him to stay. She was wearing a tight-fitting green elastic mesh garment, and her feet were strange, looking like serpents' heads, with shining slanting eyes on the insteps. Villa Fanier fled, but looking back, he saw that the woman was settling down on the sheepskins. When he showed the skins to someone later, they were not white, but yellow, as if scorched. And now some um, UFO sightings recorded by Mike Ulram in his book, Does It Rain in Other Dimensions? These were collected by him himself, speaking to people in person. On the 22nd of October, 1973, two 14-year-old lads were playing at the Rainham Marshes near the railway lines when they heard a low humming sound which startled them. Looking over the track onto the marshes, they saw a large glittering object landing. It was as big as a house. It was metallic gray, and the setting sun glistening on it made it look silver. It was round with a dome on top and looked like a classic flying saucer. It became very scared and ran away. On the 10th of January, 1973, quote, I was having my driving lesson when I saw the UFO in the sky. At first I thought it was an aeroplane, but knew it was not because it had no wings and it was hovering. It then started to fall a little, then shot straight across the sky and disappeared. This lady drew a triangle. On the 17th of December, 1972, quote, At about 10 p.m., I went to the bedroom. I could see the moon from my window, so decided to have a closer look with the aid of binoculars. Just before I went to have a look at the moon, a flashing object caught my attention. At first, I thought it was a star, but when I had a closer look with the binoculars, I saw flashing lights of red, blue, green, and silver. I called my wife to come and have a look, and she said it was a plane. She had another look with the binoculars and said, quote, If that's an aircraft, why is it not moved? It seems to be rotating and hovering. We watched it for a further 20 minutes before it shot away. The next night, I made it my business to look in the same spot, but nothing was there. I went into the garden, and there it was hovering over Collier Road in Romford, and then shot off again. On the 17th of July, 1974, one man contacted me at this time in quite a state of distress. I arranged to go to his home in Dagenham the following evening. The family had been to visit friends in Abridge. They were driving back home around 8 p.m. His wife was sitting in the front, and the two children were in the back. Driving along the quiet country lanes just out of a bridge, or a bridge, they noticed a light. It shot down out of the sky and was right behind their car. The children were very frightened, and the mother tried to calm them down, but was incredibly unnerved herself. The children actually thought they were going to be taken. The husband tried to stay calm and carried on driving. The light followed them all the way home. He rushed to the house, opened the door, and ushered the children and his frightened wife inside. In a panic, he thought he would try and divert them away from the house, so he got back in the car and started driving around the streets, and the light just followed. In the end, he drove to the police station and ran inside, begging them to come out and look. One police officer came out with him, and they watched as the light just hovered in the sky above them on the other side of the road. After about 30 minutes, the policeman said he had to go back inside, and he left the man standing there alone. The man told me that he watched it for another two hours, after which it shot away, and he made his way back home. In Flatwoods, West Virginia, on September 12, 1952, shortly after sunset, Eddie and Fred May, Neil Nunley, Ronnie Shaver, and Tommy Heyer observed what they thought was a meteor pass over them and land atop a nearby hill. Similar reports of a strange light in the sky came from other central Atlantic states that night. On the way up the hill, the boys stopped by the home of Kathleen May, mother of Eddie and Fred, and persuaded her and Jean Lemon, a 17-year-old National Guardsman, to join them. Proceeding in the direction of the fallen object, the group came upon a surprising sight. About 75 feet away among the trees was a pulsating object, or ball of fire, about 20 feet in diameter and 6 feet high. One boy thought he saw some animal eyes in the trees. The dogs with it began growling, and its hair stood on end. When Lemon shone his flashlight through the mountain fog, the group saw a huge figure standing beneath the lower branches of a tree. It was 10 to 15 feet tall, and had a blood-red face with two greenish-orange eyes that glowed like a wild animal's. The head had a pointed hood shape around it, and the body was draped in a garment similar to a monk's. As the monster began floating towards them, it made a hissing sound. The group, extremely frightened, fled down the hill. Kathleen May was hysterical. Some of the youngsters were treated for shock, and some vomited for hours from the pungent, irritating odor that had permeated the hill. About an hour later, the local sheriff led a posse armed with shotguns and searched the hill but found nothing other than the sickening odor still lingering over the area. The following day, the editor of the local paper found two parallel skid marks and a large circle of flattened grass where the pulsating object had been seen. 
Now, I think I should note that the cover I put together for episode three of this podcast, one called Confrontations, has an image of, I think, Kathleen May and a drawing of the thing that they saw, which has become actually rather famous in pop culture to a degree. And if you just type in Flatwoods Monster into a Google image search, you'll see all kinds of art and depictions and comics and even little toys and sculptures of this strange entity that these people reported. So, yeah, check it out. It's pretty interesting. It's a rather really strange looking fellow there. Looks kind of like a cross between some kind of a skeletal spook and a nun. On September 18th, 1877, one W.H. Smith saw something unusual in the skies over Brooklyn, New York. It was something so odd that he felt compelled to sit down and write a letter to the New York Sun about it. It was, he reported, a winged human form. Three years later, a marvelous apparition appeared over Coney Island right next to Brooklyn. Many reputable persons saw it, according to the New York Times, September 12, 1880, and they all agree that it was a man engaged in flying toward New Jersey. This thing was described as a man with bat's wings and improved frog's legs. It passed over Coney Island at an altitude of about 1,000 feet, making movements which closely resemble those of a frog in the act of swimming. A man's face was clearly seen attached to the monster, and it wore a cruel and determined expression. Various experimenters were toying with crude gliders in those days, but not over water or populated areas. They considered a flight a great success if they managed to glide downhill for just a few yards. Our next winged man was a headless quote-unquote angel. Four young shepherdesses playing along a ridge near Quebeco, Portugal, in the summer of 1915, reportedly saw, quote, a figure like a statue made of snow, which the rays of the sun had turned somewhat transparent, hovering in the air. One of the girls, Lucia Abubara, later became a central figure in the events of Fatima, Portugal, 1917, when a large luminous disc circled over the heads of 70,000 people gathered in a field. Yeah, the Dancing of the Sun incident, many accounts of that. In his book on this famous quote-unquote miracle, William Thomas Walsh states, quote, Senhora Maria de Freitas, a Portuguese writer and daughter of a famous editor of O Seculo, told me in the summer of 1946 that long before she had heard anything about the apparitions at Fatima, a woman in the district repeated to her an apparently absurd tale brought home by her daughter, who said she had seen, and some others had seen, a, quote, white man without a head floating in the air. Mr. Gray Barker, a prominent UFO researcher, uncovered a strange story in a 1922 edition of the Lincoln, Nebraska Daily Star. The witness, who remained anonymous in the account, claimed that a large circular object landed near his home and an eight-foot-tall being stepped out. Gray relates the story, quote, A deeply religious man, the witness was certain that this huge being must be none other than Satan himself. Remembering his Bible teachings, he mumbled, Get thee behind me, Satan! and turned his back on the creature. As he turned, he noticed another disc coming down from the sky, and it hovered above him as if to protect him from the landed creature. Next, the witness heard voices emanating from the airborne saucer, appropriately quoting biblical texts. The creature on the ground, which the witness definitely felt was hostile and intent, became discouraged, as if the voices had a deterring effect upon it. It took off on foot, rapidly disappearing. The witness tracked the devil to where the disc had landed. Further adding fire to the diabolical theory was the fact that the thing left tracks similar to hoof marks and went through a barbed wire fence, which was left burning hot and severed, as if it had been burned through with a welding torch. We have quoted this quaint account from Gray Barker's Book of Saucers because Dr. Jacques Vallée found a remarkably similar report from Nebraska in that same year, 1922, in a letter buried in the Air Force UFO files at Dayton, Ohio. The letter writer, William C. Lamb, was hunting near Hubble, Nebraska, when at 5 a.m. on Wednesday, February 22, 1922, he heard a high-pitched sound and saw a large, dark object pass overhead, blotting out the stars. He hid behind a tree, he said, and watched as the object landed. Next, he saw a magnificent flying creature, which landed like an airplane and left tracks in the snow. It was at least eight feet tall. It passed by the tree where Lamb was hiding, and he tried to follow its tracks but never managed to catch up with it. In the summer of 1946, Europe was engulfed in a new wave of inexplicable events and phenomena. Quote-unquote ghost rockets appeared over Scandinavia in great numbers. Over 2,000 reports were collected by the Swedish general staff alone. Finland, Norway, Denmark, and the British Isles were also affected. The phantom objects were seen as far south as Greece. Strange glowing cylindrical objects weaved through the valleys of the Swiss Alps. Everybody blamed the Russians. The Russians denied it. The newly founded Central Intelligence Group, forerunner to the CIA, sent General Jimmy Doolittle to Stockholm to find out what in the hell was going on. All of this was a full year before any Americans had even heard of flying saucers. The Swedes were not only seeing cylinders and saucers in their skies, they were also seeing enigmatic birds of some kind. Huge winged creatures without heads. The ghost rockets cornered most of the headlines in the European press, and the strange headless birds were given only a passing mention. 
In June 1947, the first flying saucer scare struck the United States, with the earliest publicized sightings occurring in the state of Washington. On Tuesday, January 6, 1948, Mrs. Bernard Zykowski of Chahalis, Washington, heard a, quote, sizzling and whizzing noise. She looked up and saw a man flying about 200 feet above her barn. He appeared to be equipped with large silver wings held onto his body by straps, and he seemed to be manipulating some kind of controls on his chest. After hovering and maneuvering for a few seconds, he shot upwards, and his wings retracted close to his body as he rose. He did not flap and fly. I know most people don't believe me, Mrs. Zykowski said later, but I have talked to some people in Chahalas who tell me they saw the man too, and that he flew south from Chahalas and apparently came in from the north or west. Quote, it was about 3 o'clock p.m. on the Tuesday after New Year's Day, and there were a lot of small children coming home from school at the time. They saw the man too, and asked if they could go into my backyard so they could watch him longer as he flew toward the south end of the city. A report in Portland's Oregon Journal, January 21st, 1948, added, Police Chief Tom Murray declined to investigate. An army official at McCord Field commented that it sounded like one of those saucer deals. I just can't put any stock in it at all. Four months later, on Friday, April 9th, 1948, a trio of mysterious birdmen put in an appearance at Longview, Washington, which lies in a straight line about 40 miles due south from Jahaz. Mrs. Viola Johnson and Mr. James Pittman were outside the laundry where they both worked when three Buck Rogers types flew past. They were not wearing wings, but seemed to be somehow flying without benefit of rotor blades, rockets, or propellers. Quote, they looked like three men in flying suits flying through the air, Mrs. Johnson recalled. They wore dark, drab flying suits, and as far as I can judge, they were about 250 feet high circling the city. They were going up at about the same speed as a freight train, and had some kind of apparatus at their sides which looked like guns, but I know it couldn't have been guns. I couldn't see any propellers or any motors tied on them, but I could hear motors which sounded like airplane motors, only not so loud. When they first came into sight, I thought they looked like gulls, but as they got closer, I could make out that they weren't gulls, and I knew they were men. I could see plainly they were men. I couldn't make out their arms, but I could see their legs dangling down, and they kept moving their heads like they were looking around. I couldn't tell if they had goggles, but their heads looked like they had helmets on. I couldn't see their faces. Mrs. Johnson and Mr. Pittman called for their co-workers to come out and take a look, but by the time others reached the spot, the strange trio had flown off. Ten years later, in Kent, England, four young people were walking home from a dance along a quiet country road near Sandling Park, Hythe, Kent, on the evening of November 16, 1963. John Flaxton, 17, was the first to notice an unusually bright star moving directly overhead. They watched it with growing alarm as it descended and glided closer and closer to them. It seemed to hover and then dropped out of sight behind some nearby trees. I felt cold all over, Flaxton recalled. He and his friends had seen enough. They started to run. The light bobbed into view again, this time much closer, floating about 10 feet above the ground in a field some 200 feet from the panic-stricken quartet. It was a bright golden oval, one of them reported, and when we moved, it moved. When we stopped, it stopped. Once more, it went out of sight behind the trees along the road. Then, suddenly, there was the snapping of twigs and branches, and a huge black figure shuffled out of the bushes towards them. It was the size of a human, Mervyn Hutchinson, 18, told police later, but it didn't seem to have any head. There were huge wings on its back, like bat wings. Charles Bowen, editor of England's esteemed at Flying Saucer Review, summarized the case in FSR's casebook, The Humanoids, and mentioned three other interesting reports from the same area. Quote, on November 21st, 1963, Keith Croucher, age 17, reported seeing a solid oval light in the center of a golden mist crossing a football pitch near Sandling Estate. And on the night of November 23rd and 24th, John McGoldrick and a friend went to Sadling Woods to investigate the previously reported sightings. They found a, quote, vast expanse of bracken that had been flattened. They also found three giant footprints, clearly defined an inch deep, two feet long, and nine inches across. On December 11th, McGoldrick and his friend went back to the site with two newspaper reporters and found the woods illuminated by pulsating light. They watched the light from a safe distance for half an hour. They were too scared to get closer. And now a collection of strange reports from Chile. Near Arica, miners saw UFO land and two entities came out. They asked for water in a mixture of English and Spanish. Witness gave them some, and they departed. 15th June, 1964. Pilot and crew members saw UFO. It was mechanical and came towards plane 6 September 1985. At Isla de Chilo, phantom ship Caluche seen in 1968 and other times. Near Osorno, man trekking in forest saw a beam of light in UFO and became paralyzed. Then human-like entity about four and a half feet tall appeared as if from thin air, wearing wrinkle-free translucent suit late January 1967. Pampa Yuskuma, near Putre, Corporal Armando Valdez walked towards light, UFO perhaps, and returned after 15 minutes with five-day growth of beard and watch calendar advanced five days, 25th April 1977. 
At Puyuko, UFO with violet light landed, then five minutes later took off at speed. Trees found uprooted in clear landing circle with massive soil missing, never found, 31st July 1965. Near Tokopiya, UFO seen by several witnesses and police who investigated saw luminous object approximately 60 feet in diameter in helicopter-like cabin over the sea. Sergeant shot at UFO, which moved fast to within 150 feet and illuminated the area like daytime. After several hours, it sank into the sea, observed by ship's crew, 23rd and 24th September 1971. August 27th, 1952, Lamberton, North Carolina. A saucer-shaped craft, 3 by 2 meters, landed on witness's property after hitting a chimney. A little man about 70 centimeters tall emerged and was asked whether he was hurt, but he did not answer. The craft took off with a whistling sound. August 31st, 1952, Pennsylvania, exact location unknown. Herbert Long saw an object land 15 meters away from the road. He made a drawing of it. September 12, 1952, at sunset in Flatwoods, West Virginia. Well, oh, here we go again. A group of young people saw a meteor land on top of a hill and went to the site with Kathleen Hill and three men. They observed a globe as large as a house making a throbbing or hissing sound and a huge figure with glowing orange eyes nearby. About four meters tall, the figure had a red face and quote-unquote floated toward the witnesses who fled in terror. A lingering smell and skid marks were found. On September 13, 1952, at 2000 hours, Frameton, West Virginia, Mr. and Mrs. George Snitowski and their little girl suddenly found their car stalled and an unpleasant smell, ether mixed with sulfur smoke, filled the air. Mr. Snitowski thought a chemical plant might be burning in the area and walked toward a strong light visible in the woods in spite of the nauseous smell. Coming near it, he felt pricklings throughout his body, had to stop, lost his balance several times as he returned to the car where he found his wife terrified, pointing to a giant creature, three meters tall, human-shaped, ten meters away. They locked the car as it inspected the vehicle, glided away and went into the woods. Soon afterward, the sphere of light was observed to rise gradually, to swing like a pendulum, and to leave a luminous trail. October 15th, 1952, 1910 hours, and Le Vigan, France, approximate date. Figures with helmets and masks were seen through lighted windows inside a bright yellow cigar-shaped object on the ground. Length 30 meters, diameter 6 meters, forward section was rounded, and a sort of fog was noted at both ends of object. October 27th, 1952, 203 hours, at Murignane Airport, France, Customs officer Gabriel Gachinard observed a cigar-shaped object land briefly on the airfield 100 meters away, producing a dull sound. The object was dark with four lighted windows. It took off with a swish and a shower of sparks when the witness ran toward it. In November 1952 in Dublin, Ireland, a child was burned when a strange disc 25 centimeters in diameter landed near Dublin. On November 18, 1952, in the morning, in Castelfranco, Italy, Nello Ferrari, 41, a farmer, found himself flooded with a reddish light and saw a large plate 10 meters above him between gold and copper in color. At the center of the bottom surface, 20 meters in diameter, was a cylinder of 5 meters diameter made of rapidly rotating parts, producing a noise similar to that of an electric motor. On the upper surface was a turret inside which three occupants were visible looking directly at the witness. They looked perfectly human, wore rubber coveralls and transparent face masks. They spoke a few words which were not understood. A loud metallic noise was heard, and the top part of the object lowered itself toward the lower plate. The sound gained intensity, and the craft flew vertically at very high speed. November 21st, 1952, at Belle-Ile, France, at a place called Le Bout, a luminous sphere, which seemed to spin, its color changing from orange to white, was seen at low altitude. It oscillated left and right, then took off toward the southwest, according to the witness, Mr. Gauchy. In Lapeer, Michigan, a man claims he saw a small, gray alien-like creature inside a house in southern Michigan. The Lapeer County witness, who didn't reveal his name, states that the encounter was the last in a series of UFO sightings that took place during the summer of 1994. He said his mother was driving he and one of his friends back home from a weekly bowling session at Oxford, Michigan, when he noticed some bright lights in an empty field on the left side of the road. I thought there was a football game or some event going on, not realizing where we were. The field was completely illuminated at least 100 yards, and as I observed this, I noticed a large triangular object, he wrote on the MUFON website on Tuesday. The triangle-shaped object, the witness explained, was hovering 100 feet above the ground. He added that it had, quote, three white lights on each side of the triangle, in a dome with a red laser-like placed around the center. With a red laser-like placed around the center. Well, that's what it says. As he pointed out the oddity to the two other occupants in the vehicle, the man claims they appeared to be in some sort of a trance. That's when he says he realized that the car had come to a complete stop. I started yelling, hey, look over there, what is that? I did not receive a response. My friend was almost as stiff as a board, and my mother was glued straight forward, staring at the road in front of us, he said. After an unspecified period of time, the object allegedly flew away at speeds beyond known technology. My friend and my mother snapped out of whatever state they were in and started yelling, where, where? And I pointed to the horizon in the west sky where the object was now, and they sort of shrugged it off and kind of laughed at me. According to the witness, the object made two additional appearances during the next two weeks. 
but apparently the ordeal didn't end there. A close encounter with a creature believed to be one of the occupants of the triangular object purportedly took place during a sleepover at his neighbor's house. It was the last week I saw the object. In the middle of the night, I woke up to a sound. Everyone was sleeping in the basement that night and was closest to the stairs, he explained. I woke up to see a small three feet being, it should be three foot tall being, creeping down the stairs. He described the entity as a small gray alien with large black eyes and long arms. Reportedly, the being peeked through the stair banisters and stared at the young man before disappearing. The man reports that weeks later he realized he wasn't the only one who had witnessed this supposed UFO. I was watching TV and a show called Unsolved Mysteries was on, and the next thing I knew they had a special on the Triangle UFO, and apparently there were tons of witnesses all throughout the United States, all around the same time that I was witnessing my encounter. I also read about the Belgian wave and realized that it was the same craft that I saw, only I had a very close encounter with it. To this day, he says, he is sure of what he saw was real, as he claims that he still vividly remembers the unusual experience. Texas. A man says a group of tall, ape-like creatures entered his property and climbed onto the roof of his northern Texas house. I was currently staying at my parents' place when I had finished college, Quartz Griner, a man in his mid-thirties, told Cryptozoology News in an interview. I was chatting with my girlfriend online, now wife, at around 1 a.m. when I began to hear movement in the front of the house outside, he added about the November 2005 encounter. The noise, says Griner, was unusual, so he decided it'd be best to leave and go to his girlfriend's house in Dallas. As he headed out of his parents' residence, something else caught his attention. I was a bit creeped out, he said. That is when I caught a quick view of two large individuals cross the front lawn along the fence line. According to the eyewitness, the creatures had broad shoulders and were over eight feet tall. When seeing this, that was the last straw. I was pretty scared. I had my mother come with me to the porch because whatever was out there I wanted her to see as well when I opened the front door. As they walked out to the front porch, the man claims they could hear, quote, loud thuds on a tree coming from the fence line in the pasture. I then heard the branch from the oak at the side of the house hit against the gutter and several footsteps on the roof, said Griner. I am to this day guessing that possibly a younger juvenile creature may have gone up the tree and got onto the roof of our home. I was not at the time going to investigate. I told my mother to go ahead and get inside, lock the door, and call the authorities if they hear anything near the house. Then he reportedly got into his car and left for the night. The following day, he explains around 2.30 p.m., he returned to his parents' house and ventured out into the pasture along the fence line when he noticed something large and rust-colored in the lightly wooded tree line at around 300 yards and on the neighbor's property. According to the man, he had a pair of binoculars that helped him see the alleged creature up close. I saw what appeared to be a very large orangutan, he recalls. It was on all fours and viewed me, rocking back and forth from behind a cedar tree. It would lean out, then lean back behind it again. It then looked to its left and then slowly rose up to a height of eight or nine feet. It then gracefully walked with both arms swaying to its left and lowered again near the ground. That is when I saw the second one behind it. And as the two animals rocked back and forth, they would also look at one another and move their mouths as though they were communicating. They appeared to be talking, said Griner, and as I crossed the pasture, I noticed something big and black moving through the woods coming the opposite direction. At the time, yes, I had a small digital camera with very not useful 55mm lens, at that time, there was absolutely no detail of any subjects through that lens at 300 yards. There was much more I could see through the binoculars. I looked through them and saw the third Bigfoot creature on all fours viewing me from behind a small cedar tree. It was a little closer, but still at 200 yards to our tree line of our woods. It sat there and looked at me, and then looked left in the direction the others were on the property next door. I did not want to venture closer for a possible picture due to my safety. I very much regret that to this day. But he was able to take a close peek at the purported cryptids, the one standing on his neighbor's property had well-built bodies, were brought at the shoulders, arms hung down close to their knees, and they had a rounded head like a chimp. They moved very gracefully, and I could see the muscles in the legs move. I believe it to be an adult and possibly a younger adult together. The third creature, which walked all the way to Griner's property, was, quote, also very big. It was on all fours and at least four and a half or more as it sat couched on its knuckles behind the cedar tree. It had Caucasian skin color, round chimp head, more of a short beard, was charcoal black in color, and surprisingly I could see faintly it had gray in its bearded area. I also could see its chest going in and out as it breathed. It seemed to be an adult or close to it, he explained. To this day, Griner is certain that we saw were Bigfoots and that it wasn't a prank or a hoax. The physical qualities of the creatures were flesh and blood. I know what bears look like. We do not have bears in northern Texas. That's why he didn't try to take a picture of the monkey-looking critters, even though he had a camera. Griner says that that was the last thing in his mind at the moment. I believe, one, I was in shock at what I was seeing, and two, the subjects could not be seen at that length of distance, he said. I could see much more through the binoculars. Now I bring a variety of long lenses on every outing in the event that I have the opportunity again. I hope to have that type of encounter without much detail. Griner has now become a Bigfoot investigator and is a member of the Timberline Bigfoot team. A research group whose mission is to search for viable physical evidence of the existence of the creatures collectively called Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Regaldsville, Pennsylvania. A motorist says he saw a tall humanoid meeting an unidentified creature on the side of the road in eastern Pennsylvania. 
The man, who requested to remain anonymous, said he was driving home after hanging out with his friends the night of June 15, 2012, when he came across the odd couple standing on an undisclosed road near Regalsville, a borough in Bucks County with a population of 870. I have a heavy foot and was enjoying an exciting drive on empty roads, he wrote on a report submitted to the MUFON website earlier this month. As I was coming up to a nice S-curve, I noticed what I thought to be a deer moving through the bush to my right about to cross the road in front of me. I braked hard to avoid a collision, he continued. Reportedly, as the quote-unquote deer crossed the road, the eyewitness noticed a glowing blue light coming out of what he calls the helmet of a tall man standing on the left side of the road. Then, he says, the creature ran up to the strange man. My headlights fell directly on the pair. I had slowed down to a speed of about 15 to 20 miles per hour to avoid the collision and had a clear view directly ahead, he recalls. This next second lasted an hour in my mind. The eyewitness says the four-legged creature was similar to a deer in size, with a dark brown-gray covering that he described as being leathery. It had the head similar to a dog with an elongated snout and short ears. It had the build of a greyhound with long legs supporting a smaller, slender frame. Its legs, he explained, were bent backwards. He also said that the creature didn't have a tail. The human-like being was described as tall and wearing something resembling an astronaut suit. He was wearing a black suit that had several tools and pockets, similar to something a Navy SEAL would wear during nighttime ops, he said. The strange-looking man also had a visor over his eyes, out of which emanated a soft, velvety blue light. He was watching me as closely as I was watching him as I passed slowly seven feet away. We made eye contact, and the blue glow followed me in my rearview mirror until I made the next bend, and he was out of sight. Then he says a disturbing telepathic event took place. I felt him call to me. It was like a feeling more than words. It wanted me to come back. It was a strong urge to turn around, mixed with feelings of peace and tranquility. Suddenly I realized that I had unconsciously brought my car to a stop. This frightened me to my core. It still does. I immediately floored the car and blew the stop sign at the end of the road as I raced home in safety, he explained. According to the eyewitness, however, this was not an isolated incident. Triangle-shaped flying objects hovering over his property have now become a recurring event. I have had many sightings and feel as though I may be under surveillance. Not long after that, I became aware that I was being startled awake several nights a week at precisely 3.33 a.m. The man is now asking for help to help him understand the sighting and to keep him safe from the alleged creatures. I want to know if anyone else out there has seen this man with the blue light or are being monitored by flashing lights. I also need to know if my new daughter is safe. Is there any way to be safe? Will a secure bunker keep them out? Is there a possibility that these are non-violent harmless watchers? Or are they all invasive abductors, he said. Last month, a former Marine in Ohio claimed to have witnessed a similar creature with bent backward legs as he and his wife were driving home. That was a public service announcement designed to scare the shit out of Human spirits, a quick rundown, or what to look forward to. Human spirits are just the state we exist in after the death of the physical body. It is parallel, yet not identical, to states of astral projection, out-of-body experience, some near-death, post-death experiences, states of trance, psychedelic drug-induced states, states of sleep, in a way, and many others. They exist on many different levels of being, in ways we exist in their world right now, and they in ours, but that goes for all the spirits I'm referring to here. They tend to have more powers, if you will, and a wider range of abilities than other types of spirits, but not all. For example, human spirits have the ability to change their form more easily than some other types of spirits. They don't need to eat food or drink water to survive, though they can do both for enjoyment, art, punishment, etc. They don't need to breathe air to survive, yet they still have lungs. Even though each human exists before their physical birth, their spirit body is built out of the physical body. Their previous existence would comprise a different body. How you treat your body and brain in life affects your spirit, body, and mind after death. The ones I know tend to be the age they were at death, or are generally around 30 years old. In lower spirit places, however, they can be aged, diseased, deformed, and generally physically horrid. They jokingly sometimes consider us to be dead, and themselves very much more alive. All the human spirits I've asked have said that they vastly prefer their spirit lives to their past physical lives. They also say that sex is better after death. Dying while being severely addicted to a drug can be extremely unpleasant for a human spirit. It tends to land you smack down in the lower realms. Committing suicide because of mental despair is a huge mistake. Suicide because of physical despair is a different story. They say it can work out okay that way. Or a consciously willed suicide like Hunter S. Thompson's can work out just fine as well. But suicide out of mental despair is always one of the worst things you can possibly do. The ones I know are all from the middle to late 1800s. Oh, that's not the case anymore, but was it at the time. 
I don't fully understand why, but it has something to do with the specific types of spirit worlds which I'm tuned into, and conversely, the different levels of existence people experience after their physical connection to consensus reality is ruined beyond reclamation, or otherwise known as death. They can be killed, but they are much more durable than physical humans, so some even undergo body modification to the point of becoming a goddamn Cenobite, as I mentioned in an earlier podcast. Spirits in general can be killed in a way, though not obliterated completely, as no life is ever completely extinguished. Shifting to another state of being, or a complete reincarnation of sorts, is the fate of spirits who have passed on, evolved, or been killed in some way, so to speak. Astrally projected living humans are similar, though they seem to waver more than human spirits whose physical and etheric bodies have died. They have shifting faces, as do those who have drifted in via other means. Now into non-human created spirits. They are spirit people who never had a physical life. They are born in the spirit world, so to speak created by another spirit being for a purpose like being a messenger, sexual professional, or even a weapon. Though they are truly alive, unlike a thought form, a very common aspect of the spirit world, which is basically a spirit automaton. Oftentimes, these created beings continue living after their intended purpose, outliving the being that created them, and becoming their own fully formed personality. They can be created in virtually any form, from an anthropomorphic cat warrior, to a demure school teacher, though they are more fixed in their forms and abilities than human spirits are. Now, to get into some rather controversial territory, what I was uh, talking about at the top of the podcast. All right, now another type I'm just going to call the ultra-terrestrials. They're the ones I mentioned in an earlier podcast as being of a very different type, the ones I referred to as others. They are the beings referred to as aliens in ufology. Contactee reports an abduction phenomenon. Palladians, Greys, Bentes, Nordics. These are all labels that have been given to them or that they've given to us. They are responsible for the legends and stories throughout various cultures' histories involving the little people, the fair folk, the invisible ones, and more. And I should say that there are many, 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 many different types beyond what we would call Pleiadians, Greys, Bentes, etc. Many, many more. The countless varieties of these beings have been given many names from many cultures. She, Tuatha de Danan, Elves, Gnomes, Trolls, Dwarves, Goblins, Hobbits, I have a little postscript on that one. Corrigans, Kelpies, Tengu, Kappa, Tommyknockers, Mermaids, Ant-Men, Menehune, etc. Now the little thing, I little asterisk I have next to Hobbit. All right, at the time of writing The Hobbit, J.R.R. Tolkien created the word Hobbit out of rabbit and hob. Unaware of the fact that the name Hobbit had already been used in folklore to refer to a small, earthy type of fairy folk. Synchronicity? Or perhaps more evidence that they've been dipping their little hands into our brains and our business for ages now, nudging us ever so slightly like wind-blowing chimes. The thing is, I know a couple of them intimately. They are in the room with me right now. But I really haven't grasped the nature of their existence. I should remind you, I, I can't see them. I'm not clairvoyant, but I can experience them and communicate with them the same way I do with, you know, spirits of people who have passed on or otherwise. A lot of them are from other worlds, Yet, they are an inextricable aspect of this planet. Sometimes they insist that they quote-unquote are us, in a way, but they are also definitively alien. See, things get very complicated with these guys. They also exist mostly beyond the physical, yet can also take solid physical form, something which is almost always impossible for other spirits. They really tend to befuddle the rational mind. <sighs> so, if you want to be all folklore about it, I have a relation to or connection with some fairies and an elf and a gnome. If you want to be all UFO about it, I have a relation to or connection to some gray types, a Nordic, and a dwarf type. I know it sounds silly, and I still feel a bit silly writing those names, but those words are just labels given to something we really don't understand. I decided with them previously that I will not give their personal names here. Names are extremely important and powerful to them. That is also a theme that runs throughout the occult, though separating the occult from fairy folk and UFO phenomenon is a bit of a semantic runaround. I've known my quote-unquote gnome friend for about six years now. Well, at the time of writing this, I've known her for six years. I first made contact when my guide indicated that someone wanted to meet me. This new contact pulled my arm to a Paul Laffoley poster I had and pointed my hand to an image of a gray-type alien showing me that she was one of the little people. She is about three and a half feet tall, 216 years old, and resembles a cross between your typical gray-type alien and a turtle. She has lumpy, brown, earthy skin, very large eyes, and a beak-type mouth. Her arms are extended like an ape's, and her neck comes out from the front of her upper torso, giving her a sort of hunched look. That bipedal, humanoid form of hers I just described is very much who and what she is in the apparent here and now, but that is not the quote-unquote original form of her people, who are not humanoid at all. She identifies more with spiders and scorpions than mammals. Well, not emotionally, just morphologically, so to speak. 
Scary bears and dogs in games and movies terrify her, but giant scorpions and spider beasts do not, as they tend to upset us humans. She's actually been very hurt when I've called a spider in my apartment a disgusting little monster. She is invisible to the physical senses, but more here than the other spirits I know. She doesn't have access to the same spiritual states and astral realms that my other spirits do. While she is of a people from another world, she is also a part of this planet. She is associated with the earth element. She has work that she does in her realm, which involves minerals and other earthy things. I really don't understand it entirely. She has higher-ups of sorts, but she refuses to call them bosses or authorities. Her people seem to be somewhat solitary. Initially, I embarrassingly assumed that she was male. After inquiring about it directly, she said that she is more female than male, if she's going to apply our labels and concepts to herself. She says that her people have much more than just two sexes. Then, later on, she said that we human beings also have more than just two sexes. And I thought about it and realized, she's right. There is heterosexual male, heterosexual female, homosexual male, homosexual female, bisexual male, bisexual female, different types of heterosexual male, different types of homosexual male, different types of homosexual female, etc, etc, on and on. I realized that she enjoyed watching movies, TV shows, and video games with me. At first I assumed it was for all sorts of sci-fi reasons. She's studying our behavior. She feeds off the reactions my brain creates while engaged with these things. She likes seeing other places in our world, etc. I found out over time, though, from sensing her reactions and asking her questions, that she mostly enjoyed them for the same reasons we do. She is engaged by the characters and stories in our media and also gets a thrill from the action in video games. As an aside, though, something she absolutely cannot tolerate in games and such is violence against animals and innocents. She absolutely abhorred the hunting in Red Dead Redemption, especially the skinning of animals, though she's not against hunting for survival. At some point, I was watching a TV show with her, and I got up to go to the kitchen, and she kept pulling me back. Nothing beyond my control, it just feels like a strong magnetic force pulling my arm. I was confused as to why she would do this. I assured her that she could keep watching without me, and she strongly disagreed. This is when I found out that she, and the other spirits, have to use my eyes to perceive the image on a TV screen or computer monitor. The television itself is visible to them in their realm, but this TV screen doesn't convey the image that our physical eyes see. They have to use my eyeballs, optic nerves, and brain in order to see the image that we see on a TV. Makes sense though, since televisions were technologically created to be experienced by the human body. Another interesting point is that my other spirits, who are passed on humans or other types, cannot see the screen through my eyes, while the brownie, the elf, and the fairy all can. I don't quite understand it. It gets even stranger because those three can then transmit the screen's image to the others who cannot see it. So you have the rather obtuse situation of my TV receiving an image, which is then shot into my eyes, which send it to my brain, which I see, which the attendant alien, so to speak, then receives and transmits to the other spirits. I've been in situations watching a movie or whatever with one or more of my spirits, but without one of the quote-unquote aliens present, and the spirits could not see what I was watching at the time because no alien was present. Well, you don't hear that sentence every day. Anyway, uh, to complicate things even further, none of them can read written language on a screen, even while looking through my eyes and brain. Though they can read language via my eyes if it is written or typed on paper, hence the old Ouija board technique. More on that later. I have to read writing on screen out loud for them. Okay, see, that's changed now. Over the years, they've been able to adapt things to where now they can read the uh, language through my eyes. I don't understand it. It's, that's just what they tell me. After experiencing and being surprised by my spirit's use of my nervous system for things like watching TV and automatic writing, I read that at one point, skeptics had debunked the Ouija board after blindfolding someone using it who then failed to get any response, therefore proving that it was the person's own subconscious at work. Later on, a channeled spirit, known as Patience Worth, was asked about this, and she said something to the effect of, how can a musician perform music without an instrument? My spirits say that the combination of a physical human's perception combined with a symbol system, which has the potential to create language, a Ouija board, creates a very strong conduit of sorts into what we understand as the physical world. If you blindfold the person, you cut off the perception of the symbol system. If the person can't observe it, the conduit is lost. Perception, observation, is the essence of multidimensional technology. And I remember racking my brain once as to how in the hell a Ouija board could work and, and why it would do what it does. and. It, uh, it's hard to put into words, but when you understand more about how much reality in the universe is information and how much is a language in a way, I mean, our DNA is a language, that then it kind of seems to make sense how a code that could be translated into language could have very cosmic powers or a very real effect when it comes to like spirit technologies, if you will, or what some people would just call magic. 
I like to see um, different magic practices and ritual practices as being a technology of sorts. It's not like uh, one ritual works and all the other ones are not true, or one religious system works and all the other ones are false. No, I mean, it's like, you might as well say a lawnmower can work, but a TV can. You know, it's they're all different technologies. Think of like a technology of mind rather than of solid physical matter. None of them have to utilize my body's senses in order to hear what I hear, though. They experience sound and music on a synesthetic level, known only to strong psychedelic experiencers and possibly the mad. Synesthesia, if you don't know, is the experience of getting your senses kind of crossed to where you will see sounds and hear sights and so on. It's funny because there are a lot of aspects of her that conform to folklore and superstitions regarding brownies and fairy folk in general. And a lot of it I experienced from her firsthand before I read about the correlating folklore. She does not sleep, but she has a spot in the corner of my kitchen where she quote-unquote chills. It's in between the fridge and the washer-dryer. She says that she likes that spot because of the fridge, washer-dryer, oven, and dishwasher. They put out some kind of energy in her level of being that she loves. It reminds me a bit of folklore involving house fairies who love to hang out around the kitchen stove. That is where the term hobgoblin comes from, after all. Hob meaning hearth or cooking surface. I read a book by an apparent medium who claimed to be able to see spirits, and she described a brownie who had his own little corner of the house where, instead of sleeping, he would be entertained by all kinds of self-created quote-unquote glamour floating around his head like dream images. That seems to be what she does in her downtime. Now, fairy glamour, that's a term. It's basically uh, like the magic or the abilities they have to just basically see it as their magic. It's really complicated, but it usually involves some kind of obfuscation or a kind of tricking of the human mind or a kind of setting up an illusion of sorts. It's funny because a lot of the high strangeness involved with UFO phenomenon can easily be termed as fairy glamour. Something that really threw my expectations, though, is that she actually is fond of cream, as illustrated in traditions regarding fairy folk. It's one of those stereotypical superstitions of the past, leaving cream out for the fairies. I mean, it's what stupid superstitious rural folks do, right? It's like throwing salt over your shoulder, so I really wouldn't expect or want her to actually conform to that tradition. It's just silly. It's stupid, yet she still insists that she likes it. Perhaps it's one of those situations where a superstition is actually inspired by something quite real. She says that she actually consumes an aspect of it in a different state of existence. She doesn't affect any aspect of it that we can perceive. Maybe that somehow led to the mistaken notion that fairies make milk go sour. Another fairy tradition she has exercised is the one about finding missing things and such. It's not something which she is omniscient about, something a surprising amount of people somehow expect from spirits, nor is it something which can be done instantly on command. But I have found missing things waiting for me on my bathroom countertop, or where I sit on the couch, where they had certainly not been before, and she has claimed responsibility for putting them there. She has also claimed responsibility for turning off power strips in my apartment after I leave the place with the TV and or game system still on. One time I woke up to find the front door wide open, which was absolutely unexplainable to me, but she insisted that it wasn't her. I assumed it must have been an errant maintenance man, or myself sleepwalking, which I have never been known to do. The point is, I've had her take credit for inexplicable events in my apartment, and also deny involvement in things I expected her to be responsible for. And that struck me as pretty meaningful. She wasn't just a subconscious anomalous phenomenon yes man. It was one of the many, many things which have given my interactions with these personalities much more relevance as to them being real, separate individuals, rather than the parts of my own mind or the created spiritual subselves which I initially assumed they were. As I said before, I won't give her name, but it is an interesting one. It has three syllables and doesn't sound like a name reminiscent of any particular human culture. Another thing is that asking her what is going on with all the flying saucers and possible involvement with world governments and expecting her to know everything about it it's like asking a street food vendor in Guadalupe what NASA is covering up and expecting her to know everything about it. And I will say that her appearance that she describes, is, if you're familiar with the Halo series of games, there's the little, the little guys called the Grunts, the kind of cartoonish characters. I think they're called the Ungoy in the game's mythology. But she uh, very much resembles one of those guys, to the point where I remember playing Halo and it really upsetting her. I was questioning her as to why, and I finally got to that, that those grunts who you slaughter in the game really remind her of her people. And you could also say that she has a little bit of a resemblance to E.T. as well. Not E.T.'s in general, the, the movie star E.T., the, you know, the Spielberg guy who likes to get in little bikes with kids and fly across the moon and all that. All right, and that's that for now about my uh, gnome friend. He was abducted by aliens earlier this afternoon. That little girl got lost under the bed and she went into an alternate dimension. 
This article is called 10,000-year-old rock paintings depicting extraterrestrials and UFOs discovered in India. It's posted to collectiveevolution.com on August 2nd, 2014 by Arjun Walia. Our ancient world continues to become more mysterious by the day as 10,000-year-old rock paintings depicting possible extraterrestrials and UFOs have been found in Chhattisgarh, India. These can be added to the long list of mysterious and unexplained ancient art that seems to lend to the belief that our ancient world and people who lived at the time had contact with beings that did not originate from this planet. According to archaeologist J.R. Bhagat, these paintings depict extraterrestrials. The Chhattisgar State Department of Archaeology and Culture is planning to seek the help of NASA and ISRO for research regarding the paintings. And as a quote from J.R. Bhagat, The findings suggest that humans in prehistoric times may have seen or imagined beings from other planets which still create curiosity among people and researchers. Extensive research is needed for further findings. Chhattisgarh presently doesn't have any such expert who could give clarity on the subject. The paintings are done in natural colors that have hardly faded despite the years. The strangely carved figures are seen holding weapon-like objects and do not have clear features. The nose and mouth are missing, and in a few pictures they are even shown wearing space suits. We can't refuse the possibility of imagination by his prehistoric men, but humans usually fancy such things. According to the Times of India, well, there are several beliefs among locals in these villages. While a few worship the paintings, others narrate stories they have heard from ancestors about Rohila people, the small-sized ones, who used to land from the sky in a round-shaped flying object and take away one or two persons in the village who never returned. Time has come to see the world as it is. This article is called, Did a Parallel Universe Open Up? Hundreds see floating city filmed in skies above China. It was posted to express.co.uk on October 27, 2015 by John Austin. Chinese TV news reports have told how thousands of residents in two areas reported separately seeing a huge city form in the skies. Onlookers, some who are said to have videotaped the bizarre event, were said to be mesmerized as a towering city of skyscrapers appeared from the clouds. First, thousands reportedly saw a ghostly alien city floating over Foshan in the Guangdong province of China. A few days later, people in the province of Jiangxi, China, also reported seeing a similar cloud city. There were previous reports of a similar sighting in China in 2011. YouTube channel Paranormal Crucible said in a video report, the footage captured by a local resident appears to show a huge city floating in the clouds. The apparition, which was witnessed by hundreds of shocked residents, only lasted a few minutes before completely disappearing. Science can explain everything if we look hard enough. Shut up, science bitch! Nothing is true. Everything is created. Not only is he, like, ruining my life, but with all this god shit that he's into, he could be ruining my afterlife. Yes. It's a sort of interdimensional vagina that somehow appears I can interact with it. Fabric of the entire universe could be torn apart. I know my mind is changing. I'm already too far gone to know what to do. 